Hanging Dude, there it that is. Smiley Kaufman for 61. Wow. I'm Smiley Kaufman, and this is The Smiley Show. All right, welcome back to another episode of The Smiley Show. We got an awesome guest I'm super excited about this week, Greg McElroy. So we're keeping on the football train, Greg. I know this is your busy time of the year, so we're super appreciative, as as Charlie and I both know, what it's like putting out content week after week, and then obviously your job with ESPN as a college football analyst. Go check out his stuff at college, Always College Football as well if you want to stay updated on your college football, which we're college football guys. So we, we do stay updated. Well, the funny thing is, like, I feel like the football season's easy because I kind of – like everything is kind of secondary. But the spring is actually the busier time because I can consolidate my work into a three-hour day pretty easily. Yeah. But on the golf course, I'm very much dependent on who's in front of me. So I don't <laughs> like my busy time occasionally is actually the spring because there's a lot of pieces to pick up because my game is trash by the time yep. February rolls around. And you know where we live, Smiley, like mm-hmm. it's Bermuda. So the grass hasn't even come in. It's still dormant. And like I'm grinding and shooting 97s <laughs> for about three or four weeks. So yeah, I would say this time's busy, but golf season for me is actually maybe a little bit busier. Remind us where your golf handicap is, just so we set the set the table here. Uh, yeah, you know, it just depends on who you ask. Um, I think <laughs> I offic- <love> <laughs> official gin is three point eight. Um, okay. You know, it just uh, seasonally, seasonally, it uh, fluctuates for whatever to, reason. I'm you don't have why. to tell me, man. You don't have to tell me. So I can't play winter golf. Like I suck. So everyone's like, you're such a bagger because come tournament time in like May. It's actually pretty good. But, dude, I literally have such a head case that I cannot play unless the grass is popping. And that's so, and that, that makes sense coming from a quarterback, right? You play on perfect turf as a quarterback. Like 100%. any all football players ever complain about is when they're slipping and sliding. It, <laughs> right. you, you can't have that type of grass. So it makes sense coming from a quarterback that you got to play on that lush green grass. That's it. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like I'm very much like weather dependent golfer. If it's cold, I'm terrible. If it's windy, I'm terrible. I'm from Texas. You'd think I could play in the wind. Can't. Uh, if it's if the grass is dormant, I'm terrible. If the greens are fast, I'm terrible. I need like perfect conditions to play well. And usually they come up right around tournament time. So that's usually about how it goes. So um, and I can't play my home course. Like I'm I'm terrible on Birmingham West. So it's <laughs> well, well, just welcome know, to the party. I don't play good there best, either. I must say. <laughs> I've hit one off the clubhouse before on five. So considering that's happened, it, it's just it's just tough sometimes. It's all yeah, good, I've been, though. I've been on a similar line, maybe not quite the clubhouse, but <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine makes it to the parking lot there. <laughs> well, I know that means you could have not have played quarterback at Notre Dame because they play in, a, I would say, a pretty good primary rough on that field. So, And that's that's kind of where I want to take the beginning of this conversation, right, Is is that the spring, the fall, all these camps, you're, you're looking forward to football season and we're catching you two weeks in. So all that, the four letter word that everybody talks about heading into the season, which is hope, you know, that kind of goes quickly after that first snap and you see what type of football team you actually have. LSU every year we start 0-1. So I kind of set the <laughs> table every year that we're going to be 0-1. But for, let's talk about like a team like Notre Dame. Right. Like have such a big win in that first week. Second week was the Northern Illinois. I mean, just kind of set the table for us. Just your first overall impressions of teams like Notre Dame and then other teams that have been off to really nice starts. Well, I think it's I think it's for Notre Dame in particular, it's no different than a guy winning, you know, their first tournament and missing the cut the next week. Like it's really not that it's still the same guy. You know, it's just the approach or the relief or the exhale that they took after the first performance and the comfort they felt having gotten that win at A&M led to them playing really poorly last week. And I thought their plan was bad. I thought they got beat along both lines of scrimmage. They looked a step slow. I mean, and they're not supposed to look a step slow when playing against a team like NIU. Um, The problem is that it's now, it's a little bit like, well, they also just won their first tournament. So they have a two-year exemption. So they're chilling (laughs) now because we have a 12 team playoff. You know what I mean? It's yeah, and that I think is going to increase the likelihood of teams not playing great every week Mm. because you don't have to be perfect anymore to get to the twelve team playoff. 
you can essentially play your way out of the playoff. If you're Georgia, you could have two games that you play awful and you're still in. And and you're you're ten and two. You might even still win the SEC at ten and two, and you might even end up with the first round by at ten and two or eleven and two. So I think there's going to be more and more teams that play poorly and play down to the level of the competition, knowing that they don't have to be undefeated or have one loss to get in the playoffs to have a chance to still win the championship. So Notre Dame was the first victim. They won't be the last. Uh, there'll be a num- number of other teams that get upset throughout the course of the season because they let their guard down against a team that they think they're superior to. And most of us know that you played quarterback at Alabama, the starter there in 09 and 10. And during that era, right, where I, I still believe that was the BCS time, right, where it was just two teams yeah. that made it to a national championship. So when you're in the locker room in the offseason and, and heading into the fall, I mean, Alabama maybe can get away with one one loss and still make it. But for the most part, like you're talking about how teams are can kind of let off the brakes towards the end of the year, maybe a little bit more than they used to, because when you're at school, I imagine it just was insane every single week that the discipline and the preparation had to be at such a high level because you couldn't make a mistake. Yeah, you couldn't, but you also like that was kind of demanded in that program, right? Like playing for Nick Saban. If you know, you're kind of on notice every day. I mean, and I'm not talking like week to week, I'm talking like practice to practice. Uh, you get the impression that you can always be replaced. So there's that healthy fear that existed Mm. within the program. So that that's why I think his teams just never dropped off. I mean, like they were always just crazy consistent because you were scared to death. Like if I don't play well and my name's Jalen Hurts, like two is coming off the bench and, and here we go. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's a little bit different. uh, It's a little bit of a different animal, but you're right. Like even last year in the 14 playoff era, Florida state didn't lose and they didn't get in. Right. Um, you had to not just be perfect if you're Florida State, but you also had to be healthy because that was ultimately why they were left out because they <laughs> were inadequate at the quarterback spot when Jordan Travis got hurt. So, and everyone else that was competing, they're the four teams that actually did make it. They were all healthy. So that was the difference, and they were ultimately left out. So it's unfortunate, but it's just the way it was. Now you can screw it up multiple times. And Mm. still be fine, which I'm hoping down the road will lead to better out-of-conference schedules for a lot of these teams. For instance, LSU lost week one to SC. Yeah, it's is the sky falling for sure, at least the immediate aftermath. Yeah, falling in this house. (laughs) The world is over, essentially. Like, we should cancel the program. But at the same time, like, there's still hope. Like you referred to, I can still get there. I can still be where I need to be at the end of the year if I can just take care of business at home against some of the teams we'll be playing against. You'll have Bama in your house. You'll have Ole Miss in your house. You'll have Oklahoma in your house. So there's still a lot of meat left on the bone for LSU. But I'm telling you, you're going to see teams that blow it. Mm. Um, And you're going to see teams that feel super comfortable. And then they're going to go play against a team like Virginia, who's got a pretty good quarterback. And then they're going to beat them. Like if Miami plays like Virginia in week eight and they're sitting there at seven and oh, would it surprise anyone if Virginia beat Miami? Probably not, because I just no. think that's going to be more likely to happen in this current era of college football. Well, Greg, Charlie's a, a North Carolina fan, but he's also a, a noted uh, putter tinkerer. And you talk about the fear of losing the starting job. I think Charlie has really demanded that out of all of his putters and especially his starting putter, well, his starting quarterback. Let me raise you. Let me raise you oh. some putters. Okay. Right. No, just for the record, moving the camera just a little bit. All right. You want to talk about head case when it comes to like I buy a putter a year. Right now I'm going with the lab Mez one. Okay. That thing's on life support though. Like Bettinardi's <laughs> about to get back in the bag. Then Scotty, like it's just a disaster. So I understand if you're a putter tinker, like I, I feel your pain. Are you all blades guy or, or it sounds like no, a, dude, a see, labs like, a mallet? It just it kind of goes anywhere, huh? I fe- I viewed playing a mallet putter as if it was like a sign of weakness forever. I'm like, oh, phew, uh, I'm not playing that. Like no. <laughs> I'm a blade guy. Like I looking at a mallet, I feel like I'm looking at a dinner plate. Like I yes. just can't do it. <laughs> and then I put it with what I'm like, dude, why didn't I make this move like 10 years ago? This is so <laughs> stubborn and so stupid. It's just so much easier. So yeah, I wish I would have done it a long time ago, but hindsight's 2020. So putter tinker, I get it. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I get it. 
and it always fixes it. Like we recently moved, so I don't have my putters sitting out right here, but yeah. I, I'm currently in like an Odyssey Versa one blade that is, has been the putter for a while, but then play, put it on some bent greens was on Bermuda all summer, put it bent recently. Pace wasn't good. I'm kind of <laughs> eye in the Odyssey seven over here with the wings on it and saying, Oh, maybe you're back in the rotation. Just mix Went it out, up. Just, you got to mix it up and then put it terribly it and right back in the blade, the blade. That was yeah. enough. Just need a little wake up call. When yeah. you uh, d- d- talk to me, when you have an arm lock putter <laughs> and a blade putter in your bag at the same time, because <laughs> oh, you just take a take I, a seven. I, I, have a, I have a broom in this office. Okay. I have a full on broom. That's how far we've gone in the experimentation uh, spectrum. I have yes. taken at times. I've taken driver out and put an extra putter in, depending on That's the course. Like if it's playing a little bit lower, if it's like 68, 6900, take the driver out, three wood in. You can give me two putters because I can't putt. <laughs> I'm there. I get it. It's not that these things lead to like head case moments. That's all it is. That's it. We, we, we need we need that. I mean, I think that's part of the psyche of playing golf. And it's it's part of the I think it's part of the psyche of any sort of competitive, you know, Dude, football. football uh, like these quarterbacks yeah. are like obsessed. Do you realize that when I was with the Cincinnati Bengals and I was only there for a year, but they were convinced that the the mud out of the Ohio River, which is right next to the stadium, that was what made the ball tacky enough to like be perfect. And not mm. no no other mud, like mm. no other like wiping it down, scraping it down. Like it had to be that specific silt from the Ohio River that made the ball spin the way it needed to spin. Like we are the same way in football when it comes to being crazy, <laughs> uh, and that's a reactionary sport. So to be crazy in a reactionary sport is a little unique but yeah we're all a little bit we're all a little bit crazy when it comes to sports man it's the best we definitely are and and golfers are that way we just had a uh a quip we put out today was to hit the olives using two eight irons because he wasn't hitting his seven iron any good so that's very relatable (laughs) when it comes to quarterback (laughs) using the mud from the ohio river and quarterbacks now right nil is just blown out of the woods like these quarterbacks are making so much money at these big programs charlie and i were talking about this before you came on on you know these these quarterbacks are held to such high expectations because everybody knows how much we think they're making it actually sounds a lot like a live golfer we think we know how much they're making so the expectations are high but also you know the internal locker room is going to be a little bit different on how that is handled so for you greg we're you were the starting quarterback at one of the biggest you know, football universities that we have, you know, during an age where NIL wasn't a thing. It was more of like, OK, you got to your hotel room and there was an envelope. So everybody there was no like <laughs> issues internally in the locker room about how much everybody's making. But I want you to just kind of talk about the time when you were in college with, you know, guys like being being able to be coached harder and and also just having just the 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 funds now that that these guys didn't have back when you were playing. Well, I uh, so it's a lot of layers to that question. First of all, the the check that was in the the envelope that was in your uh, hotel room was thirteen dollars. That was your per diem. <laughs> For one night away, <laughs> and you did, you got a per diem. I don't know if you got one, Smiley, at LSU, but like we got yeah. one. Um, and I'm like, what are we supposed, what, what do I need a 10 and three ones for? Like the vending machine doesn't even take ones. Like this is just, you know, it, I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, long story short, the NIL world has made it a lot tougher on coaches because there's a few different layers to this. One, the coaches are all now in the fundraising mode. Like they're all having to go out. They're essentially politicians. They're having to go out and fundraise hmm. during the season, during the off season, going to try to generate enough interest in their program amongst their boosters to support their NIL program. So the coaches are out there trying to get as much money as possible for their collectives. That's the first layer. The second layer is that the coach has to manage the expectations by those that are already on the roster versus the freshmen that are arriving. So if you want to land like a hot shot freshman, you might get into a bidding war. And ultimately, that number that this freshman now expects is higher than that of what maybe your best player at that position makes on your roster already. So you get the freshman and he's earning more having never played a snap 
Then a guy that's been an all-conference performer for two years, how does that make sense? Well, the all-conference guy hears about it. He's like, hang on, I want more than the freshman. I've actually done something in college. And then all of a sudden, you have to leverage him up. And then everybody else is mad because he got leveraged up and you got to balance things out. So you're basically playing the salary cap game, which is why a lot of the coaches have hired general managers because they don't want to be hands on in the negotiations. <laughs> That's like, the last thing these coach, guys want to do, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to, I'll, I'll delegate that to the third party. Like, I don't, I'm not going to be responsible for like what you make. Like, let the nor GM does, handle Nor do they want to know. Like, Take up have... your frustration with the GM. I mean, I think that would be challenging. Uh, thirdly, if a booster pays a lot of money to the collective in an effort to get one particular guy, and that one guy isn't the best player available, then you have an NFL dilemma on your hands where the backup quarterback's actually better than the starting quarterback, but the starting quarterback's owed a bunch of money because the owner decided to pay him. Or they drafted him in the first round, and the backup – RG3 versus Kirk Cousins, like RG3 was better at the beginning, but over the course of time, because of RG3's injuries, Kirk Cousins became the better option, but he was the fourth round pick when RG3 was the second overall pick, and that mm-hmm. was a difficult thing for the coaching staff to deal with. That's a hard that's a hard dilemma. So, And that happens a bunch. Like I remember uh, in, a less, in a less popular example, Matt Flynn at Green Bay was like a seventh round pick and Brian Brom was like a second round pick at Green Bay and Matt Flynn actually beat out Brian Brom and they were in drafted the same year same draft Russell class. Wilson Russell Wilson was the other one at in R- Seattle with Flynn right well they Flynn, Flynn got over. to Seattle to be the starting <laughs> quarterback and Russell beat him out in camp and it was like this is a disaster like it's 100 percent right so it's like it's a little bit of a challenge because I think the people that write the big checks expect to see that money that they paid used on the field or else it's going to be harder to get those people to write big checks again next year. I felt, um, that, in, I felt that in Auburn this weekend. I felt that way. I was yeah, there this weekend. I did, there's a little more – like there's a little bit more that's into the performance with Auburn last weekend. Like everyone's blaming Peyton Thorne, but if you watch it a little closer, like the offensive line played terrible. The receivers didn't play well at all. Mm. Um, they gave up on a couple plays. Like I thought one of his picks was bad, but that was the last pick of the game when there's 27 seconds left and you got to make a play. Yeah. So the other three I thought were forgivable, to be honest mm. with you. Um the first one, the receiver stopped running. The second one, he got hit as he was throwing. And the third one looked like the receiver didn't really look for the back shoulder. The DB did, and he caught it. The ball was pretty accurately thrown, though, and the receiver known that it was going to be thrown there, he might have had a chance at it. But long story short, um, that's another issue. And then here's the last layer, because the NIL and the portal, it's almost like you can leverage up whenever you want. Because you always have the threat of, all right, well, I'm going to go to the portal. So if you're a good player, it's like, well, when – and you can now, by the way, end of the portal whenever you want if you're a graduate. So if a coach not giving you what you want, all right, I'm in the portal. Well, hang on a second. Um, you, you just renegotiated your <laughs> NIL deal three weeks ago. Like, and you guys, well, I'm not playing then unless you give me what I want. Oh and what God, is what the coach is hamstrung there. Um, and that's happening a lot. So there's a lot of layers to the challenge. And I think part of it is really the portal. The NIL by itself is fine. The portal by itself is fine. But the NIL married to the portal, that's where the problems have started to come to the forefront. Hmm. Great. Greg, I want to rewind a little bit here to a, to a simpler time because I was doing some research for this interview. And I, I got to say, I was a little bit bummed because – Look, we know you you went to Alabama, you got to play for Coach Saban, you won a national title, but you could have had something special. You you were offered by the University of North Carolina, where <laughs> we we would have beat Smiley Kaufman's LSU Tigers in 2010 were it not for some untimely suspensions. You could have oh, been a part of go. that. Hey, yeah, we listen, we, we, can, we can get into that <laughs> on another podcast. But I just kind of going back to – I was to, close to going there. Like I liked North Carolina a lot. They had, y'all ended up with TJ Finley though. So, or not TJ uh, Finley. Uh, TJ Yates. Uh, T, TJ Yates, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes. TJ, TJ Finley. Finley. It's too totally soon. Too guy. soon. Yeah, too, too soon on that LSU, one. LSU, <laughs> Auburn, Texas State, now Western Kentucky. But uh, TJ Yates. So it worked out.
that well for y'all. It, it it sure did, but I'm just curious to kind of rewind to you're, you're a guy coming out of a, a powerhouse school in Texas, South Lake Carroll. You know, you're recruited by Alabama, Carolina, a number of others. You just laid out the the current NIL version, how crazy it is. What do you remember about your recruitment process and, and what that was like in high school and the way that went as compared to today's day and age? Well, it is a lot different back then. Um, recruiting just started so much later. I mean, I remember, uh, I remember, gosh, it had to have been like 10, 12, 13 years ago. Lane Kiff was a head coach at SC and he offered a kid that was in like seventh grade. And we're like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The kid ended up being a pretty good player. He went on to Patrick play minors. No, no, no. <laughs> he went on, he was at SC and he offered him and the guy ended up being a good receiver for West Virginia. I just don't remember oh, off the top of Dave my head who it was. No, no. <laughs> he, was, he offered him as like a quarterback and he ended up being like a pretty good dude. Um, but he played wide out. Anyways, long story short, like it just happened way later. Now kids are getting recruited way earlier. You know, guys are, I mean, it's like golf, like guys are homeschooled basically. And they just are at the course all day long and they're working on their craft and they basically become pros at ninth grade. And then they go to IMG or they have some type, you know, they, and they play, but I mean, school is, you know, there just as a, as a way to just maintain eligibility and make sure that you're eligible to go through the clearinghouse in college. But like, I mean, things are just happening a lot sooner. Like I didn't even start in high school until my senior year of high school. Like That's crazy. before, like I started my senior year of high school, Chase Daniel was the guy that was in front of me who went on to play like 15 years in the league. Mm. Um, so I was a backup up until my senior year. But because Chase was, you know, people would come recruit Chase, it would also in turn be like, dang, the backup's pretty good too. So I started my senior year with like 10 to 12 offers. I don't remember exactly how many. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> like going yeah. into your senior year, having not played a lot of meaningful snaps. And then you fast forward to the end of the year and there's like, you know, 30, 35. But now it's like if you are evaluating your prospects in December, like where you're going to go. Like I ultimately committed to Alabama in mid-January. Like I would have been a dinosaur at that point. Like <laughs> Alabama would have moved on to the 2026 class if I was in the class of 2024 had I not made my decision by the beginning of December. So it's just very different now how accelerated everything is. And now they're talking about putting the signing period in in June mm. just to make coaches' lives easier, which I can get on board with, frankly. Like coaches are working around the clock 365 days a year. I know they're making a lot of money. But my goodness, like it's not a good quality of life. And we're losing good coaches to the NFL as a result. Yeah. So I'm okay with the changes that they're making and implementing an earlier signing period. But – yeah, the December signing period has accelerated things. So, yeah, I mean, my recruiting process was very different. Like, I had time to take my visits. I had time to assess. I was going in June. We didn't do the mid-year enrollee where you arrived, you know, midway through your senior year to get on campus, to go through spring. It's just a different era, man. Everything's just accelerated, and uh, everyone's in a hurry to go get their NIL bag, and everyone's in a hurry to go get to the NFL and hopefully get to their second contract. And you were recruited by Mike Shula, right? Yeah. And Nick Saban came in what year? Uh, my redshirt freshman year. Okay. Um, so what was the building like when, when Mike Shula was out and Nick Saban get tired? Do y'all, do you remember where you were? What was the sentiment <laughs> from the team? Was everybody like, uh, I guess this is awesome. Like was, we all, we're all popping champagne battles or we were like, Oh gosh, well, like, are we safe? <laughs> no, we were fired up. Like we were super fired up. What's funny though, is that coach Saban was at LSU and I was uh, very early in the recruiting process, starting to hear, you know, from LSU. And I'm like, heck yeah. You know, Coach Saban, like Matt Mock was the quarterback. Like I'm kind of similar in skill set, similar mm -hmm. in style, like former baseball player. Like, all right, yeah, like this place would make a lot of sense for me. And then Coach Saban left. It's like, all right, well, that that ship sailed. Um, Les Miles came in. I'm like, yeah, you know, not, you know, not a good fit. Um, so I ended up going to a going to Bama with Mike Shula, who was a quarterback coach, um, who had just won ten games the year before, had just won the Cotton Bowl. Felt like Alabama had some momentum. Our recruiting class was like a top ten class in the country. Um, in our recruiting class, there the 06 class, we had a couple guys that went on to become great players: um, Javier Arenas and Andre Smith, who was a you know a top left tackle for high school a tackle, yeah. Um, a handful of others. And fast forward, you know, we had a terrible year. Coach, And then Coach Shula gets fired. We're like, well, damn. Like, what are we going to do? You know what I mean? Like, 
Is it going to be Rich Rodriguez? Greg went back to the SAE house is what he did. <laughs> yeah, I went to the, not, it was not an SAE at that point. That was a second year pledge. Uh, I didn't know what the deal was like with the frat thing. Like that was a foreign concept. And I got to Bama. I was like, hang on, you're not in a frat? I'm like, no. They're like, well, you should be. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know that that was like a thing. Um, That's amazing. Cool. Yeah, right. Had, well, that, starting, starting quarterback at Alabama, also in SAE. How you do, Greg Macro? Well, you. you know, I wasn't the starting quarterback when I I pledge. And I'll be honest with you, my pledge ship basically was like, hey, you want to come over and throw passes to the new boys? Like, yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a good deal. Like I wasn't doing bows and toes, bro. Like it was pretty, yeah. it was pretty <laughs> like, lit. I always told him, I'm like, dude, my pledge ship is, my pledge ship is on at the football facility. All right. Like I go through four years of pledge ship, dude. Oh God. Um, and I still see some of my pledge brothers around town now, but long story short, like, yeah, pledge ship was football. Um, <laughs> but looking at looking at coach at coach Shula getting fired, it's like we, this thing could go a lot of different ways, man. He was fired at, like around Thanksgiving, and Coach Saban did not get hired until January third. When Nick Saban retired and Kalen DeBoer was hired, it was like seventy two hours, maybe less. It was like fifty eight hours, and people were freaking out. Imagine going like fifty eight days is about what it felt like feeling as though that search would never come to an end. And finally we found out it was coach Saban. and we we're all jacked, dude. I mean, we were so fired up. Um, we knew it was gonna be miserable though. I mean, and it was, it was awful. Like, I mean, it, the, the first year was awful. Uh, he was basically just testing us like, all right, we're going to basically go through, uh, a, a, a process that was be comparable to military training mm to see whether or not you're going to be up to the task. Like we're going to put you through things that you never thought you could handle. And if you survive uh, and you're with us, it's going to be worth it because we're going to win a lot of games, but it's going to be awful here for this first calendar year. And it was, but um, we came out the other side as a pretty cohesive unit. We, those that weren't all in were cast away and all of a sudden, you know, we became a, a pretty good group a couple years later. What about Louisiana Monroe, after that Louisiana Monroe game? So what people don't realize about that season in 07, like we started the season six and two. Uh, we beat Tennessee for the first time. And in, in, no, we had beat them a couple of years earlier, but I wasn't on that team. But Tennessee had kind of had our number, you know, from the late 90s all the way through 2005 or whatnot, 2006. Um, so we beat Tennessee. We're sitting there at six and two. And like I said, we went through the hardest off season, the hardest summer conditioning period. It was brutal. And I think I'm not kidding. We were just out of gas. Like we you had just, nothing left. <laughs> we had after beating uh, Tennessee, y'all just went to everybody went to the booth or like, oh, no, just, no, out of it's gas just, just like from- after like <laughs> our legs were shot. We were thin, like guys were hurt. We were like, we somehow beat Tennessee and that was a great win. And it was like, we could not rally. So we lost to LSU, I believe, the next week. Um, or we had a bye week, and then we played LSU. And LSU went on to win the national championship. So, like, no shame in losing that game. Yeah. Uh, and we actually played them pretty well. Mm. Uh, and then after that, we totally wet the bet against uh, Mississippi State. Uh, that was at their place. Awful, awful game. And then that carried over to the next week where we just completely out of gas. And then against Auburn, we played a little bit better, but still not great. So mm. not to make excuses, like we lost four in a row. Uh, but th- I think the off-season challenge led to us being totally running on empty in the final month of the season. Greg, Greg I heard an unbelievable Nick Saban story recently. I'm trying to remember where I saw it, but effectively like the gist of it was – he had a reserve offensive lineman, uh, a backup lineman in Alabama. There was, it was like a Christmas practice period, like in December. Uh, and the guy had to take a flight back home to California, but he was flying commercially. And he, he apparently made a call the day before, had a state trooper escort this lineman to the Birmingham airport and had them hold the flight so the guy could go home for Christmas before flying back for the bowl game. And so in, in on that same sort of vein, what is your favorite Nick Saban story? that you tell people at parties just to kind of sum up what it was like to be around him and play for him? Um, well, I've told this one a couple times. Uh, like what people don't realize is like how good Coach Saban's sense of humor is, and but it's so dry. Mm-hmm. And like he's going – and the level of like chops busting, it's like a love language. It's mm-hmm. like the more he busts your chops, the more he likes you. And it took me a while to realize that, but it – it eventually that's kind of that's kind of the conclusion I came to when I hear his interaction with guys he likes and guys maybe he doesn't like as much. 
But like the more he busts on you, the more you guys are 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 tight. So we we're playing Ole Miss. It's 2009. Uh, Ole Miss had a defensive end named Greg Hardy, who you oh, know yeah. went on to have oh, an yeah. MMA career and like played in the NFL or whatever. And um, and he was a handful. So he was a really good player, and he was along the right side. And on like the first, second, or third play. I take a big hit and it's like, whoa, all right, that was different, you know, because we had played good teams up to that point. We had played Virginia Tech, we played at Kentucky, but Ole Miss was a top 20 team. We were on the road. It was going to be a tough game, like for sure. Very, very tough game. Took a big hit early. Kind of got a little bit like, all right, not not concussed or anything, but but definitely like, all right, I need to accelerate my process a little bit. Like I can't be holding on to the ball today. Not with that guy because he'll ruin he'll ruin the game. So we get into the red zone going left to right. I'll never forget it. We throw a play called boom, which is basically, you know, uh, outbreaking routes by the outside and then corner routes on the inside. It's a mirrored concept, super simple concept, day one install stuff, like easy, easy concept. Well, you read away for rotation. The safeties rotate this way. So I'm reading the left side of the field. And Julio Jones is my primary wide receiver. And come hell or high water, like if in doubt, I'm throwing it to Julio. That's just the way I roll. <laughs> yes. Makes sense. So I draw back. I love it. Julio's there. I'm throwing it. We're going to throw a touchdown at Ole Miss. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to quiet this place. Bought Hemingway. It's triple covered. In the flat is a guy named Preston Dial, who's our H-back. I mean, wide open. The guy could have done the moonwalk into the end zone. Instead, <laughs> I throw a triple coverage back of the end zone. Bad decision. Whatever. Incomplete pass. We kick a field goal. Live to play another down. It is what it is. Later in the game, same situation, except this time I'm on the right side. I'm working the right side. I got Marquise Mays, who's in the flat. Julio's in the corner again. This time, there's no way they triple cover Julio, right? Like, I drop back, throw it triple cover to Julio again. Marquise Mays is wide open in the flat. You know, I go back to the sideline. I'm here about it. You know, I'm on the phone with Coach McElwain. Hey, well, you know, what are you seeing? Like, come on, man. Like, tighten up. All this other stuff. Well, we win the game. Everyone's happy. It's all good. It wasn't a great offensive performance, but our defense played awesome, and we started to get it going a little bit towards the end to kind of put it on ice with the run game. So, fast forward to Sunday. You get a call from Coach Saban's office. It wasn't uncommon, but it's not one that you wanted. <laughs> you know, <laughs> calls you in. You know what he wants to talk to you about. We go and we we take a look at a couple clips, uh, and I know what clips they're going to be. It's going to be the boom throw to the left, the boom throw to the right. First one he looks at, all right, what would you see here? Coach, I should have thrown it to Preston. He's wide open in the flat. I don't know why I didn't. You know, I just kind of got locked in on Julio, and I should have come off it, and that was on me. All right, sounds good. What about this one? Same situation, Coach. I, you know, I felt like getting to the maze in the flat. Should have gone there for sure. I threw it to Julio. I got locked in on him and frankly, I was kind of feeling the rush all day. Like I needed to, I need to go through my reads and trust my reads, trust my eyes and not have it accelerated too much and trust my offensive line. The protection's going to hold up. You have time to get to your number two and dump it in the flat and live to play another play. Uh, he goes, all right, sounds good. Hangs up the, grabs the phone, says, yeah, come up. Yep. Grim. Yeah. You can get him. Yep. Sounds good. Hang up the phone upstairs, walks the athletic trainer, Jeff Allen, Jeff Allen takes me, goes, all right, come on, Greg, let's go. I'm like, all right, coach. Sounds good to see you. Go see you, man. Uh, I walk downstairs with Jeff Allen. Jeff Allen is sitting there. He goes, all right, we're going to we're gonna have to test you. I'm like, for what? He goes, we're going to test you for a concussion. Coach thinks you have a concussion because there is no way on earth anyone with sane mind could make that decision twice in the ballgame. Uh, so, so like, hey, I did the concussion test. I'm like, Jeff, can I just can we can I like be a little concussed? You know, maybe just have a slight veil of an excuse for having that made that decision twice. So yeah, I mean, just little things like that. I mean, it was a bad so decision. Good. He's like, basically, maybe no, don't ever do that again. But at the same time, he had made light of it by making me do some concussion testing. It's all good. You got to love Coach Saban there. I mean, that is just absolutely epic. And I actually want to talk to you a little bit about this because I wanted to try to, you know, talk a little bit about playing starting quarterback. And obviously I was a professional golfer and the mental side of the game, right? So I've heard this term said before when – whether it's you as an analyst saying, well, this, this quarterback, they're seeing ghosts today. And I've always wanted to hear what that term means and maybe <laughs> how we can relate it to seeing ghosts on the golf course, whether it's like noticing the out of bounds stakes or noticing the lake. I just wanted to uh, kind of get your sense on what your, what your feelings on uh, seeing ghosts means. Yeah, it's well, um, Seeing goes, it's, it's very applicable to golf because like yeah. every time you take a drop, you have to be fully committed. 
You know, like it's, I mean, yes, there are things that you have to account for that are unexpected, but you have to be fully committed that the play will work. Like if you go and exit the huddle and you are not a believer that this play will be successful, like it has no shot before it yeah, even gets that started. That sounds a lot like, like picking the wrong club and wrong yeah. shot. Yeah. <laughs> you're standing over, it's like, I need to hit this low. And like all of a sudden you just forward press just a hair and you miss it right and hit it off the hosel. Like, yeah, I've done that. Um, but it's very similar, I think. And when you see ghost, it's you're just not trusting what you're seeing. So, for instance, like you see two safeties. Quarterbacks are always taught to read it from the front to the back. So you go, you know throughout your week of prep, you know what the defensive front is going to look like based on where the tack, nose tackle is, the guard, the t- like you know where guys are, and you know their tendencies like when they blitz. Do they blitz out of this formation? Do they blitz out of this alignment, out of this front? When they blitz out of this front, let's say you have a three down defensive line. All right. Well, I know if they have a three down defensive line, I got problems. Uh, so I can have problems left. I can have problems right. I need to make sure the mic's sorted out. Like who's the mic linebacker? Who are my offensive linemen accounting for? Is this guy taken two? Which two are mine? So three down fronts are hard. Four down fronts are a little bit more manageable. Um, but after you had diagnosed the front and where your problems could come from, you look at the safety and you have to identify coverages. And when you look at the safeties, you either see two or one. And most offenses are saying, all right, this is a two high safety beater. Like this throw, this route combination beats two high safeties. On the other side, this is a one high safety beater. So if you see a two high safety beater and all of a sudden they roll to one, you need to be on your one high safety beater. If you see one and they roll to two, you need to go to your two high safety beater. Then you have man concepts that you can check to if you see man and things like that. So when you see ghosts, it means that they're really in too high. But instead of going like this, maybe they went like this. And then the third corner goes that way and they play like a three cloud, which is basically a one high safety, but it looks like two. So you mm, now you, see, you now you, you know just what don't I mean? know where people are going to be. Yeah, it's <laughs> like I think I know where they are, but I don't really know where they are. Like I'm freaking out. Where's my running back? Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or did you did you ever see ghosts when you played? Oh my god, yes, all the time. Or? Oh, absolutely, yes. Now sometimes more than others, and sometimes the game's just moving way too fast. Like, yeah, it's just like, oh my gosh, I, this is. Or, for instance, like you see ghosts where you see an alignment and all of a sudden, hey, okay, shoot, they're rolled this way. I could have pressured this way. Let me adjust the protection. Hey, William, you go take this Mike linebacker to the right-hand side, number 57. He's yours. Hey, Mark, you take this guy to the right-hand side, number 42. He's yours. And then I'll take number 36. It's the Will linebacker. Well, you see that you adjust the protection. Now the shot clock's coming down and you got to snap it. And all of a sudden they roll back the other way and the safety's coming the other direction and we're toast. So like you're seeing ghosts because you see something, but it's not really, it's not reality. Like you need to just play and react. So um, seeing ghosts is a very real thing. It's not that dissimilar than uh, like, I've never played Augusta, but like they always talk about um, hole 12 mm-hmm. and how, you know, the smart play is to hit it right over the tongue of the, of the bunker. Right. I I guess that's what they say to me. That seems like a really you have a bunker in the front, a bunker in the back. And I really don't want to be in the bunker in the back. So I feel like I did bail out left. But long story short, I feel like a lot of players, because of how that hole sits into the terrain, overanalyze the wind. And they're looking at it and they're thinking, okay, I got I don't there's no wind up there. And then the announcers are always like, there's wind. I'm just telling you, account for the wind. You're going to hit it in Ray's Creek. Like, you're going to account for the wind. I think that's kind of what seeing ghosts is. Like, it's not really there, but it is to an extent. So it's like, it's just seeing things that aren't really reality is what seeing ghosts is. And that's that's a hard thing that to deal with. And it's a hard thing to shake, really, as a quarterback. It really is. It's terrible. <laughs> Greg, I think that chess game of football that you're describing where you're a quarterback, you're processing all the nuances of a defense is absolutely fascinating. And and I also think that, you know, we're seeing new wrinkles, at least at the professional level this year, things like the new kickoff rules. Everyone's just kind of going from scratch to going back to the drawing board, trying to come up with stuff that's going to work with no real reference point. I'm curious, just from an offensive defensive perspective, how much of the concepts in today's modern version of the game 
it's just something cyclical. Something old becomes new again. There's a new kind of fresh, you know, invention of what you're trying to do versus just guys that are that are you know smart enough to to understand what offense you know what offenses have been trying to do the last three to five years and coming up with something that's completely new or fresh. Well, there you know it's always um, it is cyclical. Everything about it is cyclical, and a lot of it has to do with how teams have well in college. Let's just use college. How teams have recruited. Um, so for example, like, let's go to the big 12. This is a good example. The big 12 basically was a league that was kind of line of scrimmage in the nineties, you know, Ricky Williams, Adrian Peterson, they're in the early two thousands. Like they were very much like physical line of scrimmage league. A&M was a line of scrimmage team. Kansas state was a line of scrimmage team. And then Mike Leach got the job at Texas tech. And it's like, all right, well, We can't run it against you guys because we can't recruit offensive linemen that can mow you off the ball. and We can't recruit defensive linemen that can stop the run like Texas and like Oklahoma. So I'll come up with a new concept where you have to cover us in space. And we think that our receivers, which we can recruit, are going to be better than your run stopping safeties when we get them in one on one coverage. So as a result, Texas Tech started scoring a million points. And in 2008, they were one of the best teams in the country with average personnel. And everyone's like, hang on a second, why don't we do that? Like, we have good personnel. Imagine what we would do with that offensive mentality. So they started running it. Then the Big 12, over the course of like six, seven, eight years, became a league where you might have to win games 66 to 59. And then people are like, well, hang on, man. These guys don't, these guys that are throwing it all over the yard, like they're soft along the line of scrimmage. Exactly. Like that, that was the big debate. Like Oklahoma State, LSU. Right? That was, that everyone always said oh, Oklahoma State would have definitely can, beaten LSU that, that year. And, and all the SEC hardos who were still into running the football, controlling the line of scrimmage, controlling the clock. That's kind of how it was in the SEC for a while. And 100%. then along comes Oklahoma State. And then it started to just change college football. Yeah. Well, Oklahoma State and Oklahoma and Texas did it too. Like it it was like a slow, you know, and then I think then the Big 12, though, basically said, all right, well, hey, these guys, these teams are soft. Like they're throwing all over the yard. Like we're going to run down their throat again. And now you look at the Big 12 and it's like Utah. They're, they weren't in the Big 12, but now they are. Kansas State, Oklahoma State, like they'll run the ball over and over again. <laughs> so I think that like it's we backwards. have gotten – and you look at linebackers. Like if you look at linebackers that have been drafted in the NFL the last couple of years, they're all 230 pounds. Like when I was playing, it was Rolando McClain. He was 260. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's just the bodies have changed. So the game has gotten more athletic, sideline to sideline. Mm-hmm. So guess what's going to be the next iteration? People are going to start putting the fullback back in because no one knows how to stop downhill ISO. Mm-hmm. It's That's coming back. Like whether it comes back tomorrow or 10 years from now, it's coming back. The only issue is that offensive linemen are not as skilled as they mm-hmm. once were. Mm-hmm. Um, that's because – a lot of reasons, but it's just become a very seven on seven league. So quarterbacks and wide receivers develop really fast and offensive linemen, what are they gonna do? Go stand in the corner and like pass block against air. Like it's, (laughs) there's nothing you can really do. So I think that we, the game evolves pretty regularly, but I do think what's old is new and what's new is old and things kind of come and go, you know, as teams start to recruit to defend what made playing against them difficult. Like for instance, like Bama forever, Nick Saban was against running tempo. And then ultimately he's like, well, hang on. If uh, I'm just going to run tempo then like I'll just run tempo. And then teams started to slow Bama down and disrupt their rhythm. And now Bama's get kind of getting back to being a ground and pound type of team the last two years. So it's just, it's, it's cyclical and we'll continue to see cycles of it. So unless you can recruit like super NFL talent, like you're going to see cycles of and systems that go in and out of vote. Well, Charlie, I don't know about you. I love just like talking football. Like I, I think this is why I just love college football so much. Talking with somebody like Greg, who knows so much about it, um, has done an incredible job as an analyst. Obviously, go check out his podcast, Always College Football, to stay in tune. But Greg, you were the one guy I called before I got into media. The first guy <laughs> I called. I was like, Greg, you're in it. You're doing great. Tell me why this is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a horrible idea. Why would you ever want to be on? I mean, it's a terrible job. Um, 
but it is pretty fun. <laughs> it is fun. fun. And it's a heck of a lot less stressful than having to pull the club back one shot off the cut line on a Friday afternoon. Like yes. I see you now and you're sitting there and you're having Smiley's <laughs> Corner or whatnot. And what did we call it? Smiley's Corner? Uh, it's, it's, it's either Fridays with Smiley or uh, Happy Hour. Happy Hour. Yes, yeah. Fridays with Smiley or Happy Hour. And like it's a great life. But I'm really proud of you, dude. You've done an awesome job. Thanks, brother. Um, but it's just been cool because, look, I, like I grew up watching golf like y'all. It's cool to see the young guys like you and Colt and like bring in a, diff- you know, a little different spin um, to a game that's been covered the same way forever. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I listen to y'all's pod, you know, listen to the guys in the no laying up pod. Like everyone does a great job and the game is now attracting like a lot of young folks. So it's it's cool to see you having the success that you're having. And I'm not at all surprised, but uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it because while it's not playing, it's the closest thing to it. Exactly. And what I've found too with people that cover golf is that y'all actually don't work. You guys actually play more golf than the actual <laughs> golfers that are working. Um, or so uh, I've been told. I don't know about all that. How many rounds <laughs> do you think I've played at Shoal Creek this year? I would say, so what is today? September 10th? I think Shoal Creek, you might not have played that many. Um, okay, Shoal like, Creek, Vestavia combined. What, what, what do you okay, think? Okay, like I'll say, like I'm not t- saying home course, but I think when you're on the road, you can probably find time for, for some game. <laughs> then again, though, I, I, did see, <laughs> I did see our boy, um, Johnson Wagner, literally take a divot the size of my keyboard (laughs) out of of the like greenside fairway um, at the PGA championship. So I I do think that maybe your game is not as tight when you're (laughs) on the road, but I still think you're playing. Is that not accurate? He's a a range rat. I mean, this guy dragged me to the range in Denver. We couldn't even over uh, Memphis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this guy wants to go grind on the range. <laughs> I I've played three times at Shoal this year. This year, I've maybe played five or six times at Vestavia, and I've probably played uh, f- maybe three or four times on the road. That's probably about it this year. You're a rookie, though. Like yeah. you're you're still <laughs> early in well, your career. When you, tra- you don't realize when you travel with your clubs for so many years, right? Like I I don't want to travel with my clubs. It's like the worst <laughs> process ever traveling with your golf clubs. And for the most part, like our days are long, and you know we're we're there to you know like we come on the afternoon i just i'm not a morning golfer guy i'm a much more of a, a sunset golfer guy so <laughs> i've just never really just said you know what 8 a.m i'm gonna wake up i'm gonna go play golf somewhere like on the road. it's just not i don't know just not for me but you but. could in theory just saying you, you have multiple trucks that cover the events correct like, yes it's not like oh, yeah. you just have your a unit and your b unit and your c unit like for golf it's a pretty heavy lift. oh yeah you could fit a, an extra set of clubs. Uh, I would imagine I think, on your I think unit. Colt. I think Colt leaves his uh, clubs on on their talent trailer and <laughs> sends them along. You have talent but trailers. I'd, yeah, unreal. Yeah. You golf guys are such snobs. Like us football grinders, dude. Like we don't have anything. Like <laughs> we we barely get hotel rooms, let alone <laughs> talent trailers and things well, like that. Well, tell me what your day was. All right, so you travel to like where are you going? The Saturday? country club lifestyle is not exclusive to to the actual players. You're telling me it's <laughs> it's also appeal applies to the talent too. Is what you're telling? Me. Yeah, pretty much. Well, like so, where are you where are you going Saturday? Uh, so Saturday we're doing Georgia at Kentucky. We did okay. Kentucky last week and we're doing Kentucky again this week. Okay. And okay. So first off, two seconds real quick. Is South Carolina good or was that, is Kentucky bad? No, South Carolina is good. Uh, okay. Kentucky did not play well, she plays South Carolina is good. <laughs> okay. So I should be worried. <laughs> It'll be a hard game. <laughs> it's going to be a hard game. All right. Uh, can you just walk me through like what a day looks like on a, on a Saturday? Is it production meetings and uh, just like what, when you wake up, uh, the game's at seven, what's the schedule look like? So um, we get to town on Thursdays, usually Thursday night. Fridays are spent mostly, let's not talking to the home team, hope talking to the away team. Uh, sometimes you do a Zoom with the away team, depending on how far away they're staying. Uh, but Friday's pretty chill. Usually get a good meal you know, go have a couple drinks. Like we're not quite like the ABC wide world of sports guys where they're just getting absolutely, you know, after it on Friday nights before they broadcast the next day. But like, we like to, that's like the haze in the barn. Let's have a cocktail. Let's get a bourbon, like enjoy just this moment of solitude before we have to go to work the next day. 
Saturday, wake up early, dude. I can't ever sleep on Saturdays. Were mm-hmm. you like this? Like when you're playing or like you're doing a big game or a big uh, I, event? Like I, I have been a great sleeper. It's never been an issue for me. I, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, like a, take it as it, as it comes during the day. Yeah. See, like I'm up crack of dawn on Saturdays. Like I'm so pumped. Like I'm really excited to like wake up and like do the game and like watch games and like watch game day and get a workout. So I'll wake up, usually get a run uh in before because i don't something about like running like clears my brain and i like just think about the game and i don't know why it's just it's borderline psychotic (laughs) get a run most of our games are usually at night and or at 3 30 if i had an early game it would adjust but i usually we have a production meeting around eight uh then after that go up get showered get cleaned up we have a camera meeting with the camera crew four hours prior to kick. So I'll meet with the camera crew. We'll go over the storylines, some of the priorities that we have within the broadcast, things to watch for, maybe personality quirks that the that the coach mm. might have, things that, you know, maybe the quarterback in the center got into an altercation on the sideline last week. Let's watch that relationship. Hey, the defensive end was yelling at the defensive tackle last week. Watch those two and their interaction. We're focused on this receiver and this matchup, this corner and receiver matchups, two potential first round picks. We'll watch that. That defensive end, I don't think you can block them with their left tackle. (laughs) We'll watch that. So just priorities within the game plan. Then we usually go print the boards, do up, do all that upstairs, last minute scratches, go through pronunciations one more time. Uh, anyone that's hurt and or out, take them off the board, print the board, laminate the board, go down to the field, watch warm ups, go back up, rehearse the open, do the open, kick the ball, get done with the game, drink ten beers. Like that's pretty <laughs> much that's pretty much the way there things go. Is. So yeah, uh, and it, you know it's it's a great gig. It's super fun. Um, it's very rewarding to, you know, tell guys stories and, and it's really cool to get to go to these incredible games yeah. every week. I mean, we get to go to awesome games every week that a lot of people would love to go to. So we're really, really lucky and we try to bring it home to the viewers for sure. No, uh, absolutely. It's the same with golf, but the, the one thing I'll say that I, I hate that now I'm in the TV business that any sporting event that I watch, I watch it from a TV's perspective. I'm wondering <laughs> what the producer's saying, like what exactly is in their ear right now. I can't. Is it the same way for you? Like when you watch anything, like I feel like once you've done it once and you've had something in your ear, it, it feels like it ruins how you watch TV. Well, it's weird because I know with you guys, it's really hard. I, I don't know how y'all do it because you'll be, you know, calling you know, Maverick McNeely's trying to get up and down on 13 and then you're sending it to Colt who's on 16, you know, with, you know, Sam Burns, who's just, you know, about to drain a lot of traffic. footer a lot of traffic and then going he's going to Dan Hicks. It's like, dude, what is going on? Like, we how got, do you, we have what so many, hole are they on? Like we I have don't 18, even know. we have 18 games to watch, right? Like 18 yeah. different holes. You got one game to watch. It's all in front of you. You got all, all the bells and whistles for that particular hole that that game that you're watching and so that's why golf is so difficult you know you got so much to cover and you can't cover everybody and you think to throw in commercials right yeah it's <laughs> i don't know how y'all do what you do like it's because it's hard enough to it's hard enough to like be at a golf tournament and while you have your featured group that you have it's you know it's easier to manage but like when you're kind of bouncing around and i also find it fascinating like when a guy is totally tanking and they <laughs> call you off of it <laughs> so I would be curious to get your perspective on this. Like when they call you off, you're like, Hey dude, Ryan Palmer's six over through seven. Like, Oh, they move me. They move. Yeah. And I they move, move you. Yeah. What does, does Ryan Palmer see you walk away? Like, and I'm not using, I'm not trying to like, I'm not putting him on blast. I'm just using him. The first name that came to my mind. He's like, Oh God, like he, I just saw smiley leave. Like I must really be playing bad. Like, am I no, getting passed I, up by everybody? It, it, uh, for the most part, when you start making bogeys, the guy, the TV guys go away. But if you're playing good, the TV guys show up. That typically how it, is how it goes. <laughs> so you're just used to it as a player at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're playing good or if you're a guy that's, you know, a high profile player, you expect to be, you know, the, you know, the guys for the most part are, are watching your groups week in and week out. So yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of fun. I know you have a lot of fun doing what you're doing. I thank you again, Greg, for taking time out of your day. And, um, there was, there's one thing I want to leave you with and I, I it just needs to be, it just needs to come from the heart. This seems to be <laughs> like something you can't ever lie about to me because you know, we're friends, right? Sure. 
Did did Patrick Peterson pick that ball off? No. You're telling me that Patrick Peterson did not pick that ball off when you were throwing it to him? He Absolutely will. not. He was out of bounds. And I'm not even sure he ever had control. See, the thing that's funny to me <laughs> the is like... <laughs> divot is in bounds. <laughs> the, first of all, the, the amazing thing to me is, one, when did he ever establish control? Two, he was out of... He, like you can take a still shot of anything. Like If I were to take a still shot right now of me compressing the golf ball, mm-hmm. and I'm just, just one still shot... Now, is that in the middle of the club face? I don't – who who cares? It, did I hit it thin? Eh, you probably can't tell from the screenshot. The still shot, you can't tell. <laughs> so you have to acknowledge like, all right, well, the still shot looks pretty good, but that ball was actually – it flew up the club face of the 56 degree and it landed 37 yards short on a 115 yard shot. <laughs> it looked great on the still shot, but you have to take into account the entire picture. So the video itself from start to finish does not give me any conclusive evidence that would make me believe uh, that he caught this, that ball, secured possession, and he's remained immediately in He was a starting quarterback at Alabama, and the guy should have been a lawyer, too. I, I don't believe this guy for one single second. It's We're- not about <laughs> what you know. It's about what you can prove. Uh-huh. And unfortunately for LSU, you couldn't prove that that we ball was intercepted. We could not prove it. We cannot prove it. You're right. Well, I agree, agree to disagree. Whenever we have Patrick By Peterson the way, on the show. Had he intercepted it, would it have made a difference? Y'all weren't scoring anyways. That's a good <laughs> Like, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, whenever Patty P comes on the pod, which hopefully we'll get him on, he's a big golf guy. He loves playing the game. Saw him out in Tahoe this year. We're going to roll this clip for him and see what he thinks because I think he'd have a great reaction to it. I think Patrick will definitely disagree with my findings, but like I say, <laughs> I need the proof. That's all I need. I need the proof. Oh, man. All right. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate your time, man. Let's go uh, hit some hit some uh, hit it on the golf course here pretty soon. I know uh, you're a busy man, but look forward to seeing you soon, whether it's on the course. Maybe it's going to be at Bottega Cafe where I always seem to run into you as well. (laughs) Sounds good, buddy. Enjoyed it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. You know, I listen to this podcast. It's really cool. And all of our fans and subscribers, but make sure you like and subscribe. It's cool to see what you guys are doing. I know golf fans appreciate it, but we we do too, so please keep it up. For all the good people at YouTube, like and subscribe. You guys have some good takes, so I'm happy to come on and, and shoot the